Hello. Three weeks ago when I started this channel, I said I had one subscriber. Um, and now, a matter of 21 days later, I have more than a thousand, which seems to me to constitute a measure of enormous success um, by my own standards. I think it took me over a year to get a thousand subscribers on They Got Away With Murder. So this is huge success for me. I'm delighted and thank you very much for everyone who's who has subscribed and has left uh, a lot of uniformly positive comments in the comment section of the channel. A number of people have said that they guessed the ending, um, which surprised me a little bit. Uh, not because uh, they shouldn't guess the ending, it's absolutely fine to guess the ending, but the stories that I'm writing are about the journey, not the destination, uh, and they will continue to be. So if, you, if you're surprised by the ending, then that's absolutely fine. But if you're not, I hope you'll enjoy them for the journey, which is what they're about. Have you ever wanted to make a billion dollars? It's really very easy. Ask Jake McKenzie. How to make a billion dollars. Jake McKenzie was lucky. He always had been. He was born on the 7th of July, and since his 7th birthday, he'd known 7 was his lucky number. Naturally, he was a betting man, and as a betting man, he knew all about the odds. He knew how they were calculated. He knew the mathematical theory of them, but he also knew they depend on the favour of the gods. The toss of a coin may fall heads or tails, 50-50, according to the mathematicians, but a clever man knows it is more than this. When the gods smile on you, you have a lucky streak, and vice versa. The trick is to know when to run with your luck, when to test it, and when not to. Jake knew how to sit out a long run of bad form, too, until the gods, ever capricious and mostly unpredictable, wanted to play ball again. The gods were smiling now on Jake McKenzie, resident of East Village, New York City, planet Earth, and he knew it. It lifted his step. He stood up straighter, whistled in the street. He smiled at strangers on the subway. He even asked a woman he saw on a morning platform 450 feet underground one day for a date, and knew she would say yes. She didn't, actually, but Jake was in no mood to countenance defeat or a breach with his run of luck. The gods were just running slow today, like the trains. He was, therefore, not the least bit surprised when the woman walked over to him, red-faced and smiling embarrassedly, a couple of minutes later, and gave him a piece of paper with a name, Laney, and a number on it. There were three sevens in her number. How did he know it? He smiled at her, said thanks, before she turned away, glancing at him over her shoulder, laughter in her eyes. Then he pushed the note in his top pocket, and patted it twice. Aphrodite was yawning and smiling apologetically at her protégé. There was such an inevitability in everything Jake did, and he knew that you're a fool if you don't take the gods up on their gift. You have to act or incur the displeasure. It may mean that all kinds of improbable bad things will form an orderly cue to cause you mischief and misfortune. But Jake was a fine player, he went to the track and won a four-horse accumulator, threading some long odds together into a hefty wad of crisp notes. And women, they say men are like bloody buses, but so are women. Old girlfriends called him up out of the blue. At a party the previous weekend, he was spoiled for choice, and in fact it spoiled his choice. But he wasn't complaining if his riches were causing him embarrassment. His state lottery ticket even presented him with a nice little win. Not the big prize, but all in the unerring flow of improbable good luck. He was so spooked by the favours of fortune, he walked into a betting shop on a whim one lunchtime and perused the running board lazily. The 2.30 at Monmouth Park, New Jersey, caught his eye. A horse called Lady Luck in the seventh race at seven to one. It was an omen he couldn't ignore. He didn't need to check the form or wait. It was there to catch his eye. If there was such a thing as a cert, which there seldom is, then this was it. Ten dollars booked on the nose. 
Five minutes later it came back eighty dollars. He walked back along the streets, paved with golden sunlight. Cock of the walk. Heads or tails, said his friend Jerry Weinberger, at Dugan's wine bar, eager to test out his friend's new prowess. Heads, said Jake. No, tails, he corrected himself. He was testing the gods. Tails it was. Jake took a drink nonchalantly. How about now? asked Jerry, a quarter at the ready. Tails. No, heads, he said. Jerry had already flipped the quarter, caught it on the back of his hand, had it concealed under his fingers. He examined it surreptitiously. Sure, he queried, and then, smiling, shaking his head, said, Heads it is. You are a lucky son of a bitch. Do it once more. I don't want to use all my luck up flipping a coin, reasoned Jake. Oh, come on, just for fun. Is there money on this? grinned Jake. A billion dollars, said Jerry. A billion dollars? Jake was thoughtful. Okay, let's do it. Jerry flipped the coin. It danced in the light, turning somersaults over, tantalizing them with ambitions for a billion dollars. Then Jake, in a sudden swift movement, reached out his hand and snatched it from the air and brought it under the flat of his hand to the table with a single word. Tails, he called. He left his hand covering the coin, and then slowly, his face fixed upon his friend, deigning to satisfy his own curiosity, he lifted his hand from the table to reveal the shining quarter. In God we trust, said Jerry, struck with awe. You owe me a billion dollars, Jack reminded him. I'll take it on easy installments. A cent a week for the next 762 years, agreed his friend. Jake was thoughtful at lunchtime, and Jerry was keen to attach himself to this mood of impossible confidence in his friend. You know, he said, you should try a look at a casino. There could be some real money there. You need to cash in while you're hot. A long God's bet is a fool's game, Jake informed him, shaking his head. There is such a thing as tempting fate, too, by placing a thousand dollars on number seven, for instance. No, I don't mean betting on number seven on the roulette wheel, his friend assured him. Betting on a street or a corner or fifty-fifty, odds or evens, red or black. Red or black, Jake considered. You could make some big money, said his friend. I already have a billion dollars, Jake reminded him. He warmed the idea over another drink or two, to the possibilities his run of luck might afford him. He popped a couple of quarters into a machine and won the hundred dollars jackpot. My cash point machine, he grinned at Jerry, nodding in the direction of the slot machine and pocketing his winnings. Same again? Same again, said Jerry, and watched his friend moving towards the bar. It was a long lunch of drink, of speculation, of dreams which grew to skyscrapers on some distant horizon. I think I'll do it, said Jake after a long silence. He looked at Jerry. I'm going to win a billion dollars, he said simply. Jerry stared at him, but his eyes were shining. You can do it, he said. He was deadly serious. As just about everyone knows in New York City, the only casino a man with ambition will visit is the Casino Lumiere on 7th Avenue in Times Square, a house which on the third Thursday of every month has no limit to bets placed, an inducement to big stakes people, or people with big dreams. Now that suited Jake McKenzie perfectly. He didn't want to be thwarted by some petty house limit curbing his enterprise when things started to get interesting. A quick check online indicated that such a night occurred the following Thursday. It was a no-limits day. He ran through his plan and worked it through, the mathematics of it a thousand times, and then once more. He needed his wits about him, but he also needed nerves of steel. The higher the stake went, the greater the risk, and by the time he laid down half a billion dollars for his final bet, the moment of truth, he would need the strength of a titan to resist the caution of the gods. 
He thought of it as he walked in the street, threading his way through the shapes and forms which passed him by, thought of it in the elevator on the seventh floor of his office building, as he sat at his desk, and as he hung from the rail above him of a subway train on his way home in the evening, as he paced his apartment flipping a coin, and lay awake in the early hours contemplating the thirty steps he would need to take to bring him to one billion dollars. There was no better time for the stars aligning in his constellation than now. Jake Mackenzie left work early that Thursday. He showered and shaved, dressed in his lucky clothes, ducked under a spray of aftershave he tossed in the air, and polished his shoes. He spent ten minutes on his hair and looked in the mirror. He liked what he saw. Last of all, he checked his wallet. He had two hundred and fifty dollars in it. He placed an elastic band around this, and beneath the band a note on which he wrote, Do not disturb. He laughed softly to himself at this, and then picked up a single crisp dollar note and held it between his fingers thoughtfully. After a moment's hesitation he replaced this on the table in his room, and from a clean ashtray in the sitting room, which he used as a repository for loose change, he collected two shiny one-dollar coins. He examined them, a Sacagawea dollar and a George Washington. Selecting the George Washington and performing a French drop deftly with it, he placed it in his side trouser pocket. The Sacagawea he returned to the ashtray. There was a nervous excitement tempered with steel about Jake Mackenzie as he left the apartment and went down the stairs in a cascading clatter of leather upon linoleum left by the door and turned onto the sidewalk. He had a single dollar in his pocket, retained because it was shiny, had not been much in circulation, looked mint to his eye. He was a man who had just a dollar. He needed to keep reminding himself of this, knew he would require this kind of discipline, and in an hour or so he would have a billion dollars. No one knew him now. Tomorrow he would be like a Saudi prince. He had one dollar to play, and nothing but it to lose. On the subway he went, a billionaire, unnoticed by the travellers, but a man whom the gods watched now in breathless excitement. They had never known such a day in New York City since the 29th of October, 1929, on that day of the big quarrel. It had been a bad day on Wall Street. When he arrived at the Casino Lumiere, Jake walked up the steps and into the plush foyer. Amidst the gold leaf and columns, pilasters redolent of Grecian ore, and velvet draped in majesty, he could feel their presence. The gods were jostling for position. He cashed in his lucky one dollar at the casino cage, where a surprised cashier behind glittering bars looked up at him. A dollar? she queried. It's all I need, said Jake. She laughed. She had dark hair and a nice white blouse. If she was still here when he left, he'd ask her out. She gave him a single dollar chip, with a curious, ironical smile. Good luck, she said. Jake walked into the hall, ignoring the blackjack table to the left, the craps table noisily about its business, and dismissed the other diversions until he located the roulette table at the center of the room. There was laughter, sudden exclamations, the sound of the wheel clattering, the murmur of the room, and sudden roars to raise the roof as a big win occurred. Jake studied the roulette table, those earnest about their play, the croupier raking in their chips, their glide inexorably in the direction of the house, too subtle to be seen, the occasional tantalizing success of a punter, Someone won twenty-eight thousand dollars and threw a fistful of chips in the air to those around him. He waited. A red and two blacks, a man in a blue jacket and loose tie, betting on various quarters in hundreds, had some system going for him. It paid off for him, too. A quarter of a million dollars. A rapturous cheer went up from the table. Jake sat down at the table and watched. A red came up, a black two reds, another black. He was waiting his moment to join the carousel, like a fine judge surfer awaiting the right wave. I'm Jake, he said. 
Hello, Jake. Others turned towards him. There was something about him. No one knew exactly what it was. It might be madness or greatness. It might be the single chip before him, which made his claim of a seat an impertinence. No one knew for sure. The croupier appraised Jake. He knew the marks and suckers, and those who had some other quality. He might be crazy, of course, but he wondered, like others with discernment, whether he was about to see something unusual. Perhaps it was the presence of the gods the watchers at the table sensed, their presence like the stillness before thunder. There is no limit, right? asked Jake, with a stillness about him, an electrifying excitement held in check. No limit tonight, sir, said the croupier. Those about the table looked at Jake's hands. The absence of big deal chips was conspicuous. The croupier had already taken this in with his discreet eyes that saw much more from his perspective on the other side. Jake held his single dollar chip in his right hand. He instinctively turned it over, then French dropped it into the other hand and produced it again. The croupier noted the move. Flash Harry, he thought. We'll see. Confidence is always a cool customer until it is proved a fool. Three reds came and went, and eyes were drawn to Jake. He did nothing. Then, at the next call for bets, he placed his one dollar chip down on the green baize with a notable snap as his thumb pressed against the flat side of the hard plastic and overcame the resistance of the forefinger against the chip's smooth edge. Black. Although there was nothing in this that should surprise anyone other than the relative paucity of the bet laid, which appeared to be the solitary chip in the possession of its owner, people were, nevertheless, drawn to the curiousness of this. Those betting watched him. Their own bets, though larger in value, their stakes greater, seemed somehow insignificant. The wheel was spun. The betting was closed. Jake sat and watched the wheel. Then the wheel began to clatter, unruly, searching for a slot to take the steel ball as it slowed. Black, announced the croupier. His paddle smoothly conveyed to Jake his two single-dollar chips. Two dollars. And those about the table watched, waited, as if an explanation would be forthcoming. It wasn't. Jake placed both his dollars stacked perfectly on Black again. Although the stake was small, something was gripping those about the table, and they knew not what it was. The croupier cast a glance at him, to see if there was something he had missed when he first took him in. The wheel was spun. Black wins, said the croupier. Now Jake removed his four dollars, moving them to red. Brows knitted. The big wheel was spun. Eight dollars. Now Jake misses a round, but guesses red. He is correct. He should have backed his instinct. He smiles wryly. Jake bets again for sixteen dollars, black for the next three spins, thirty-two dollars, sixty-four dollars, one hundred and twenty-eight dollars. People relax. The martingale system, murmurs someone. Someone else shakes their head at the folly of doubling up on a bet. But Jake doesn't hear them. They are noises off stage. He sits out a few rounds of betting, watches the run of the ball, watches the croupier's hand, the fine balance of the wheel, its lack of resistance turning on its pivot. It is random. Everyone knows it. But Jake is in the company of gods. It is a different kind of random. A red, two blacks and two reds, followed by another black, take Jake's fortunes, cartwheeling rapidly to 256, 512, 1024 and 2048 dollars. The croupier looks at him. Jake signals to take his winnings, and they slide towards him. A new person joins the table. No one leaves. Jake watches the wheel, its lure, at the physics of perpetual motion, ambitious for him here, and other ambitions hover near, their presence growing. Still the wheel turns, aware of friction on the spindle predicting its slow decline. Now he is all in for four swift reds, a black, and two more improbable reds, 
which seems insane to those who watch his game, and $262,144. It happened so fast it seems like a dream to some. The play has stopped. Jake is alone. A small crowd is gathering, filled with the wisdom of the ages, with the mathematics of caution. But Jake knows none of it tonight. He is riding his fortune like a white stallion. The gods are furiously with him, and he feels it, feels it by some instinct he cannot explain, nor rationalize. He knows it by intuition alone. It is the surest claim he has on knowledge, yet it can never be regulated, is impervious to laws and rigor. It can only ever exist in the mind of the individual who understands it by a means he can never communicate. There are doubters here at the table. There are those who wish to see their theories of the universe slay this single transgressor of its accord. Not tonight, thinks Jake. He sits and watches. He does not hear their comments. The wonder at the table is vague about him, like a myth. There is a woman in red peripheral upon his vision. She comes closer, has worked her way towards him by degrees and keen elbows drawn by success. He is aware of red. He looks at her and smiles, sedate, level in his confidence. She studies him to his face, and he holds her gaze with an unvarying, unhurried tempo. He takes in her blue eyes and blonde hair, and the drift of her perfume comes to him. Her lips are curved, a lascivious red, like cocktail cherries they glisten. He feels the breath of Aphrodite upon him, a gift, and then returns to the table. Jake needs a drink. He loosens his tie and breathes. Still the wheel turns, and fortunes are won or lost. Occasional bets are placed by others to keep it turning, but there is only one player at the wheel. Its sole watcher, intent upon the odds it plays. It is intuition alone which guides him to his guesses. He feels when a black will come, or a red, knows when he needs to hang back, but guesses still to test his intuition. The gods are with him still in harness. Breathless they watch, indignant with delight. Although minutes pass without a stir on Jake's part, all eyes remain on him, and his $262,244 of chips stacked before him. What will he do? The croupier looks solicitous at him, a slight indefinable keynote of deference is here, even as he wonders how the man's luck can hold. It can't. Experience tells him that. He's seen this before, knows the table's caprice, yet still he admires the nerve here. Shall I change the chips for larger denomination, sir? He inquires. Yes, thanks, says Jake. He pushes the heap of chips towards the croupier, who rakes them in with swift practice, returning him some larger rectangular pieces and some smaller round discs of lesser denomination. The crowd grows. The woman in red is almost touching him. She is so close. Jake's entry with one black, three reds and another black bring the crowd to open-mouthed astonishment. People begin to wonder if he can do it. The doubters recede, feeling a rebuttal of their too certain cynicism. Wonder at their knowledge of all things, if they have misunderstood the universe. Five hundred twenty-four thousand dollars, one million, two million dollars, four million dollars brings him to eight million three hundred eighty-eight, two hundred eight dollars. The doubters shrink from the table. There is a wild speculation has them in thrall. Word spreads. The management is interested. Who is he? He came in with a dollar chip, runs the legend. Surely not. He has eight million, says someone. Is he cheating? Just a murmur. It's a gag, says someone. Publicity? Could be, I guess. But if it is, Jake knows nothing of it. He is steadfast about his purpose, gripping to it like a man whose life depends on it. 
Three swift blacks interpose the remaining doubters, and Jake has sixty-four million dollars on the table before him. The croupier is in awe. The crowd now watches, its breath bated upon each turn. A slight stir riffles through the crowd. Necks crane, people jostle for position between the interludes, and then stiffen to a taut silence when the wheel spins. The woman in red will give herself to him, body and soul. She is touching him, in her mind one with him. He can take her to hell if he likes. Aphrodite has surrendered her to him in her delight. A cheer rings out amongst those speculating, as sixty-four million dollars becomes a hundred and twenty-eight million, and then two hundred and fifty-six million. "'That's what I said. One dollar,' says someone, open-mouthed, perplexed. The doubters have gone. The gods have vanquished them, may strike them dead if they dare to raise objection. A tsunami in Pacific Islands goes unremarked a war in Eastern Europe, to a bloody attrition stalls, a famine is forgotten somewhere, injustices breed like locusts on a desert plain in Africa, floods and famines are consigned to history, they do not care. No one knows more than the man at the table, he has drawn their doubts from them, the gods are ecstatic, a man who knows no doubt, aspires to their condition, he ascends closer to them with each step. I'd quit now, says a voice. Two others agree. A man with a dollar not fifty minutes ago is a quarter billionaire. Who is he? inquires a woman with interest. The woman in red has ownership of him, asserts it by the familiarity of her body against him. A lucky son of a bitch, says someone. Black, says Jake. All his chips move to the designated square and there is noise and staring in the crowd. The croupier is intent upon his business. All bets laid, ladies and gentlemen, he calls. The wheel spins again. It is the twenty-eighth time on which Jake has laid a wager. It's fifty-fifty, says someone, but it's a half-conviction. It all sits on black now. Can it be right again? They know it. Give the man some room, someone calls. They are getting close now, vicarious to Jake. The wheel is spinning still. It seems to go on longer than ever. The friction of the pivot ignores the forces of its depletion, the drag no longer sure of its grounds. The universe is doubtful of itself. Even as the wheel perceptibly slows, it goes on, seems interminable. Its cessation is no longer inevitable. Nothing is certain any more. It has become possible to believe anything tonight. At last the silver ball, hopping between the numbered slots radiating from the wheel, while eyes strain upon the colours, trying to guess where it will come to rest, slows. The individual colours, which have blurred, become discernible. The ball hops uncertainly, seeking its final place, changes its mind, hops nimbly into another cubicle, and then it stops. The wheel circles sedately to a slow, soundless stop. It is black. A great roar goes up from the crowd. Jake has half a billion dollars on the table. He is jostled, shoved in friendly delight by some, patted by others. The woman kisses him. They will drink tonight and make love until dawn, as certain as the planets in their inevitable orbits, as improbable as a billion dollars. He is the hero of the moment. Achilles could expect no greater cheer from the ranks of Greece. The ranks of Troy are silent, subdued. Even the gods shrink back. Through it all comes the quiet voice of the croupier. Do you wish to continue, sir? He inquires. The manager watches. All eyes are on him. They hope he will take it, and yet the challenge is not yet done. Jake is feeling the pressure at last. He feels faint. The world is beginning to spin before his eyes. A slight nausea has overtaken him, but he cannot stop now. He is close, and the game is yet to play. He steadies himself and takes a drink that someone offers him. He drinks it all, and looks again at the table, at the wheel. It sits quite still. The croupier is expectant. A manager looks from the house side, grave in his manner. 
for the first time, Jake is showing the signs of strain. He has half a billion dollars. In a minute's time, 60 seconds of the wheels spinning its motion around the stars, he will have a billion dollars, or nothing at all. He has rehearsed this moment, the moment of truth when he must square to this one last challenge. He has always known that it would come to this. It will be all or nothing, acting almost without consciousness, just following the mechanical will of some unknown force, prompting his movements like clockwork, he pushes all the chips before him onto Red. Red, sir, inquires the croupier. He is stunned to a quiet unconsciousness himself by the enormity of the bet before him. Half a billion dollars on Red, a voice far off says. Oh, my God, says another voice, hushed with awe. Half a billion dollars on Red echoes about the room with all the peril of sirens, Hearer, driven to fury by the woman in red, now blatant besides Jake, naked in ambition to him, sends her legend spinning about the room. No one watching is quite themselves. All have become part of a great panoply of sound and confused empathy with the drama that has swept them up, is laid before them so improbable. Red, says Jake. He hears his own voice now as a stranger. He is remote from himself, mountains away, and yet still immovable in his seat. He no longer knows if he expresses his will, or if his levers are being moved by another. He cannot comprehend what is happening, and yet he still moves and acts like he is Jake. All bets placed, ladies and gentlemen, says the croupier. His voice is unsteady. All eyes watch the wheel. A silence now falls upon the crowd. A spell is cast upon them, upon the table. Anything could happen. The wheel may disappear. They might wake up from this weird dream, or find the people in the room melt, or turn into mannequins, or plastic figures, or stone. The room may disappear. Nothing is certain here. Jake watches the wheel. He is transfixed to it. He has no expectation, asserts no will. He is caught, a player in this drama. He can scarcely know where he is, anchor himself to this place. The wheel spins and the world stops. From every available space, eyes watch it. No one dares to breathe, to break the sanctity of the moment, as though a judge awaits the jury's verdict, to know if the sentence of life or death must pass upon the prisoner. The wheel spins, and time is frozen amongst the watchers, and those who cannot see await the report of the crowd. Jake no longer has control of his money. It is in Iskro of the gods, in limbo pending the verdict of the steel ball of fortune, red or black. It is at the whim of fate, of the gods. Will they stay true to him, or render him victim of their malice? They dispense fortune in such willful random acts that it can no longer be called. The wheel spins, but is there in its tuning a slight change, to signal its decline? At last the note seems to descend, slows to an imperceptible whine, like planets in their silent orbits, audible only to the gods. The wheel spins, and slowly the colours of the slotted compartments appear. The ball rattles distant in Jack's brain. Its fortune is unknown, and yet it is already determined. It is determined because, in a few seconds, its verdict will be known, and it will be irremediable. It will be permanently etched into the knowledge of the past, and its determination will be captured for all time. Somewhere the truth is lodged already. That is purely intuitive, but it seems a rash affront to challenge it. The wheel slows, its exertions done. The ball has located the permanence of its decision in its apportioned slot, and time has slowed too, because Jack sees the ball is lodged in its slot and can discern no colour, cannot locate the meaning of colour in the part of his brain where colour is assigned. It is red. What is red? Is it the colour he chose? He is no longer certain of anything. It is red and in the slowness of the circuitry of his brain, which is turning still, 
there is an audible sensation of a swelling sound that comes in slowly, dully, and then sharpens to an immense roar of the crowd about him. The world spins, the faces come and go, the voices come in contortions of reality with the distortion of a nightmare. He has won. It took an age for Jack to realize he was a billionaire, but it came, amidst the thumping and clapping, the rousing cheers and the sounds of voices in his ear. He feels the thump of those about him. There is madness in delight, a kiss, too. Baby, she says, dizzy. It was done. All the improbabilities of the universe are coordinated for this moment. Jake left the Casino Lumiere, having been in there for little more than an hour. He was quiet, still stunned as he left the building, and walked into the dark street and its lights and traffic. He was done. He should never have made that last bet. That was insanity. He had the gods with him all the way. But he knew better than anyone how the gods punish hubris. He was a man with a plan. He had sworn himself to that plan. But when the billion was there, well, that was the time to stop. He overreached himself. He bet it all for two billion dollars. Why? He's nuts, someone said. What? A billion? Crazy, a voice said. This time the mood of the room was different. This was pointless insanity. He was not lucky or courageous. He was insane, people would say. As he sat and stared at the silver ball sitting in the black cubicle and knew exactly what it meant this time, Time had caught up with itself. Mathematics had reasserted its place in the order. It ruled over chaos again. He had bet red. Why red? Why not? He was wrong. It came up black. He had called the correct color thirty times exactly in succession, and it had made him a billionaire. And then he called it wrong, and he wasn't. Jake hardly heard the few perplexed commiserations of those about him. Most people just walked away. The embarrassment, the puzzlement that amounted almost to anger with him, an anger the gods shared at his effrontery. Where was the woman in red? She was gone, whipped away like fortune, like a billion dollars. It was cold in the street, but not unpleasantly so. It cooled him. The sound of the traffic came to him now. A ringing in his ears gave consciousness of a silence within. He hailed a cab, and slowly, heavily, he got into it. He felt leaden, heavy. It would take three days in bed to process any of this. Perhaps it was all just a dream, or perhaps he would wake up chatting with a Saudi prince on a private jet. The woman in red, who gave herself to him for moments, blonde and unequivocal, would be there too. Baby, she would say. Any luck tonight? inquired the taxi driver, speaking to the rearview mirror. He knew the answer. He could see it in the slumped demeanor of his fare. A little, said Jake. Yeah, said the driver, unconvinced. Not much, said Jake. Ah, struck out, huh? How much did you lose? Jake considered. The headlights of the cars were flashing past, the sounds of the traffic, the occasional horns, a foghorn from the river, New York at night. A dollar, he said. Mm -hmm.